in the general Western narrative, China is always the evil power that that rise up. I'm wondering in this sphere, in this weird narrative, anti-China narrative, like how can you um, tr can try to understand or appreciate China's method of developing? It's yeah, you know, because anti-communism in the United States, which again, after 1945, when the U.S. Cold War started. And after the U.S.-Soviet alliance that existed in World War II broke apart, uh, anti-communism became the unofficial religion of the United States. I mean, it was an article of faith. It was like you had to believe that communism is terrible. Whenever I started my, when I would look for a job and all the people of my generation, we had to sign an oath, I am not a communist. You had to sign <laughs> that in order to get a job in the United States. You had to say, I am not a socialist, I am not a communist. That was a part of a form that you filled out. Uh, and, and there were subversive organizations that if you were identified with them, they were officially listed by the FBI as subversive organizations. So they included black civil rights organizations, organizations for women's equality, but many of them were led by socialists because of course socialists lead many of these movements for social justice. So all of that really became illegal. I mean, literally illegal. So um, when, we, when we see the problem of anti-communism and then the other problem, which you're identifying, the hatred or fear of China or Chinese people, that, that's the, the long tradition in the United States of profound racism. The uh, Chinese Exclusion Act in the second half of the 19th century barred Chinese people from coming to the United States. The United States immigration law, which was, by the way, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, the used by Hitler uh, and the Nazis in 1933, 34, 35 as a model to construct the Nuremberg laws that used race as a qualification for citizenship in Nazi Germany, meaning designed to bar Jews from becoming citizens or, or stripping them of citizenship. The model for that was the US, uh, rate, US law because US law had so many racial elements to it. And very profoundly, the immigration law of the United States, which the Nazis were fascinated with, barred uh, Asian people from becoming citizens in the United States until, after, until the mid 1940s. So you had pogroms, you had lynch mobs, you had exclusion. The way Chinatowns formed in the United States was really as a way for surviving Chinese families to kind of band together in what were essentially ghettos uh, in order to defend themselves. So you have this, these two streams, profound anti-Asian, anti-Chinese racism and anti-communism conflating and, and intersecting when, the, when China has a socialist revolution in 1949. So for the next decades, like when I was a child, we, didn't, we never used the expression People's Republic of China. We only said Red China. We only said the evil menace of Red China. We were, I was- Red as a, China. <laughs> and, and there you go. Shirt. You're conforming <laughs> to the stereotype right there. As, as a child, we, had to, we did drills in our schools where we had to get under our desk and hold our hands over our head because- communists in Russia or the communists in China were going to kill, invade and kill us. That's how we were, that was the propaganda that we all grew up with. So now that China has emerged as a major economic power and the communist party not only retains state power, governmental authority, but obviously has a very big support within the Chinese population, uh, the US feels there's no way to stop China from its continued growth without really carrying out a campaign of aggression against China. Economic aggression um, under the banner of national security and actual military threats or reckless provocations like Nancy Pelosi's trip in August to Taiwan. And in order to get the American people to not rebel against this aggression against China, you have to indoctrinate the people with fear of communism and fear of Chinese people. And again, this historic intersection of these two evil strains in, a, in the American body politic, anti-communism and anti-Asian racism, 
have reemerged as a factor. And this is for us who are socialists who are trying to build a movement for social change and for peace. Of course, that means that fighting against this is a, is a big priority for 